I have to remember, yeah, I'm pretty sure it was Mike Pompeo who came to Taiwan to give some talks. And he was, uh, he was actually being paid by the Taipei Times <laughs> to come to Taiwan to uh, give this speaking tour. So I thought, oh, it's great. They get to pay him to come here to spout all of uh, their, their rhetoric and propaganda, and then they get to report it. <laughs> and uh, it was, it was a huge conflict of interest. It's like, but this is how propaganda works. And Hello, everybody. This is Pascal from Neutrality Studies, and today I'm talking to Michael Riches, a Canadian colleague who, who's been living in Taipei for eight years and is currently teaching English at the university there. Michael used to work at the Taipei Times, the de facto state newspaper of the Republic of China, that is, the government ruling the Taiwanese islands. This summer, Michael wrote a noteworthy and, in my view, well-balanced article about the political and social interplay of the two de facto Chinese governments, the one in Taipei and the one in Beijing. This topic has a lot of potential to make a lot of people quite angry, even just by the framing of this little introduction. But I think Michael is touching upon a very important point about the reciprocal dynamic between Taipei and Beijing and the impact the United States has on them both. Hence, he called his piece American, American Hegemony the real obstacle to Taiwan peace. Uh, this is what we want to discuss today. So, Michael, welcome. Well, hello, thanks. Uh, glad to be here. Well, it's, I'm very glad uh, for having you because this piece of yours is like um, highlighting something that I thought has been missing in this discussion about what is Taiwan and what are the, the claims of China over it that a lot of people just aren't really aware of and that's that that they are ping-ponging back and forth a certain certain narratives that actually serve both of them um so and just just before we start this one i also want to say again like this conversation is two white dudes from one from europe one from north america talking about taiwan neither of them is either taiwanese nor from the mainland china so please everybody take this conversation with the grain of salt necessary. But Michael, could you please outline to us of your years in Taiwan now why you think that actually Taipei and Beijing are reinforcing each other's perceptions? Um, well, that's a, that's a big question. Um, uh, and I think the answer to that uh, sort of comes through. It's something that's been osmosis almost. <laughs> uh, there, I can't pinpoint any particular facts. I think it was mostly, though, just working at the Taipei Times because uh, I'm very pro-Taiwan independence. I'm very um, supportive of the people here. Uh, and that viewpoint comes uh, solely just from living here, knowing the people and uh, and recognizing their rights to self-determination because that's what they want. Um, so when I went to work for the Taipei Times as a, as a copy editor, uh, I knew that the Taipei Times was uh, very independence leaning. Uh, in your introduction, you called it what I called it to the de facto state newspaper. But I, I do want to emphasize de facto because it is a private newspaper, but it does have uh, historical ties to the government. The founder of the newspaper was working as a presidential advisor while uh, <laughs> running the newspaper. Um, and, um, uh, I found it difficult to find out who actually owns the paper now, but they, they still, um, uh, you could, I could tell from what I would hear from editors and hear stories about them having meetings in the presidential office, uh, whether they were called to the presidential office, I'm not too sure, but, uh, it seemed like there were some definite ties between the, um, uh, between the paper and, and, uh, the ruling um, independence-leaning government. Um, so when I went to work there, I thought, well, you know, I'm very supportive of Taiwanese independence. I realize it has this uh, has this bent, as all newspapers do. All newspapers have their bias. And I thought, well, that's the bias that's sort of on my side. But when I, uh, when I really um, had to read all their content every day, like I wasn't just a passive reader, uh, I was, uh, you know, as a copy editor, you're just bombarded with, with all of the, the the messaging every day, and I and I just realized it was just, I didn't see it so much as pro independence as pro American and pro military. Um, I might stop short of saying pro war, um, but uh, 
everything they they printed was very provocative in that direction. It was all about military buildups, all about um, how China is hostile with this and that, and a lot of exaggerations about China. And the thing is, you know, I saw Taiwan's perspective, but I thought, geez, do they really have to uh, exaggerate uh, to this degree? Uh, do they really have to? I, I really saw it as acting as as, as propaganda, and. And I also started to think, you know, if Taiwan is, you know, wants to be an independent country and wants to act like it, why does it talk about China so much? You know, this is where uh, I, I saw that there is a sort of the, the folie a deux, you know, the, the French psychological term for the madness of two, you know, two people sharing a conjoined psychosis where uh, uh, they just can't stop talking about each other. They're sort of like two ex-lovers <laughs> who keep saying like, uh, Like, like, uh, like, she's my ex. Uh, I'm no longer with her anymore. But then he can't stop talking about her. And then she's saying, well, well, he's my ex. And, uh, you know, I have nothing to do with him. But they're always fighting <laughs> with each other. And I thought, well, they're, they're unified somehow. They're unified in, in their, their psychology towards each other. And I, this is what I saw in print in the Taipei Times uh, quite, a, quite a bit. Uh, so uh, that's sort of the... Uh, um, where I came to with that. But uh, I would say that when I came to Taiwan, you know, like any foreigner, I, I wanted to understand Taiwan. I wanted to understand what Taiwan was. Is it a country? Is it not a country? What are it, its ties with China? So um, I did live in China for a few months uh, before Taiwan. And I did hear the Chinese side of why uh, Taiwan is a part of China. Um, and it's something that I understood. Um, I still... believe eh, that's not the whole story. I still think Taiwan is independent or should be, but I still listened to the Chinese side of the story with an open mind. And I thought, well, I understand their case. So I came to Taiwan with an understanding of that. Um, and I just became frustrated with the Taiwanese because I thought if you're going to make a good case for your independence, you really have to understand China's side of the story, like a, like a lawyer fighting a case. You want to understand what your opposition is going to bring into the courtroom. Uh, so to really make your case, you have to be able to understand what their grievances are and talk about it. And, uh, and I find that Taiwanese are, are not very good at that or don't want to understand China. And when I do try to make China's case, um, not to be pro-China, but to sort of say this is what we have to argue against, uh, I'm seen as being pro-China or having bought into their propaganda. So the whole exercise becomes very frustrating. <laughs> I mean, this is this is the, the same psychology that takes place when we argue about the war between Russia and Ukraine. And if you start trying to explain what the Russian rationale for the war is, then it very quickly happens that the, the pro-Ukrainian side and or the pro-NATO side will accuse you of being a Russian yeah. apologist, right? Which is a right. fundamental misunderstanding between explaining yeah. and, and excusing. But I, I right. don't really know where that comes from. But over Over and beyond that, um, if you now look at the, the, the fact of the world, how the political world acts at the moment, and you point that out in your piece, the fact is that we have a government that sits in Beijing that calls itself the, Repub the People's Republic of China, and we have a, a government that, that sits in Taipei that calls itself the Republic of China. We actually right. don't have a government that calls itself the Republic of Taiwan, right? right? That we don't have. But we have two entities that call themselves China in one way or another. And you also pay yeah. point out how Taiwan has all of these national treasures from the mainland, which Chiang Kai-shek took with him when he evacuated, that most of the institutions in Taiwan, the Bank of China, is still like called China, Bank of China or Air China, right. the, the national. Uh, you know, all China, uh, China Airlines, right? So I mix them up too. Air China is is from China, and China Airlines is from Taiwan, right? Yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's so there is yeah. obviously a very, very, very close relationship of these yeah. two Chinese entities, but for some yeah. reason, both of them don't like framing it as such. The, the funny thing yeah. is. Neither the mainland, nor, Thai, nor neither Beijing, nor Taipei likes pointing out that currently, de facto, we have two Chinas. Yeah. Can you yeah. maybe speak a little bit about how the Chinese like to portray the situation and how the Taiwanese like to portray the situation instead? 
Um, well, with the Chinese, they, um, uh, I think we all probably know from, uh, from their, their own propaganda and their own rhetoric that, uh, um, uh, they view Taiwan as, uh, legitimately con con or should be legitimately controlled by the People's Republic of China, by the CCP in Beijing. Um, and, uh, well, I think there, there are three positions on Taiwan that need to be understood. Uh, a lot of people think there are two. One think that there's the pro-China view and the pro-Taiwan view, but there's actually three. Uh, and this is also something that sort of I've gleaned from my own research and from talking to to friends. Um, but uh, uh, but a lot of Taiwanese also don't see the three points, and, and I'll get to that in a moment. Um, I did write an article about this on my Substack too. Uh, the first view is the China view that uh, that Beijing should be ruling uh, Taiwan. Um, there is the second view, which is the Republic of China view. So when uh, Chiang Kai-shek's forces came to Taiwan, uh, they viewed themselves as the legitimate government of all of China. Uh, so there was this battle between the CCP and the the, uh, the KMT or the Chinese Nationalist uh, Party. Um, Uh, sorry, there's just a lot of history here that I, I'm going to uh, I'm skipping over, and I know a lot of people will say, "Oh, but you didn't mention this." <laughs> but I, I just want to make this brief. Uh, so the Chinese Nationalist Party came to Taiwan in the late '40s, um, and so throughout the '40s, '50s, uh, '60s, most of the '70s, um, the world and Taiwan viewed the. Uh, viewed the government in Taipei as the legitimate government of all of China, that the communists were illegitimate. So we know that uh, Nixon changed the uh, the recognition uh, in the 70s. Um, but even after that recognition, uh, Chiang Kai-shek still said, well, you know, we are the real China. Um, gradually, as generations passed, Chiang Kai-shek died, his son took power, Um, and then within the KMT, the Chinese Nationalist Party, um, there did start to become a view that we need to democratize, we need to um, let go of our authoritarian past, because the KMT did uh, conduct a lot of atrocities against the Taiwanese people. Um, and there were moves to have sort of truth and reconciliation against those crimes, um, to have more citizen involvement. So. Um, over a decade or 15 years, they had this gradual uh, process towards democratization. Um, it started at sort of a county level, then later on they elected mayors, then they elected a congress, and then uh, then they elected a president. Uh, I believe in the, in the late 90s, they had their first elected president. And through this process of democratization, uh, there, uh, there came to be a growing sense that, yeah, Taiwan is... is acting like a country. It's a de facto country. So these ties to the mainland, this view that uh, that the Taiwanese government was the legitimate government of China, that view started to just gradually fade. So there was no point where Taiwan kind of switched. It was just a very gradual fading um, where today, uh, the current generation, um, I've seen polls, the polls maybe aren't too reputable, but I believe it based on uh, the people I've talked to. Um, uh, a lot of the polls say that about 95%, maybe 90% of the people in Taiwan uh, uh, don't want to rejoin China. They say, we're not part of China, even if China democratizes and becomes a friendly country, uh, we've just developed our own identity. We've, you know, we've built our own roads and schools and Uh, develop their own government. Uh, there's been a real nation-building exercise that's happened here over several decades. So the the Taiwanese are very attached to that and say, yeah, well, we're we're different. So it would be like re, it would be like joining uh, France and the UK. You know, they're both great countries, but uh, they don't belong together. Um, they they just have separate identities. Or Canada and the UK might be a better example. Uh, considering the language and such. But um, uh, so there has been this growing uh, identity um, that is sort of, that is very independent from the, the Chinese identity. Um, so sorry, going, going back to the original question. So the first view is that, uh, that uh, 
the communists should be the re legitimate rulers of Taiwan, which is the Chinese view. There's the Republic of China view, which is that Taiwan is a part of China, um, but that the communists are an illegitimate government. Okay, uh, That view has been fading, but there are still people who hold, hold on to that view. Now, the third view is the view that China was merely an occupier of Taiwan. So uh, Taiwan has been occupied by uh, the Dutch, by the Japanese, and by the Chinese at various periods. So the independence view is, look, we have a lot of um, Aboriginal people here. We have a lot of Indigenous Taiwanese who go back generations before the before it was a Chinese province, uh, before the Nationalist Party was here. Um, so uh, they view um, uh, Taiwan as merely just, just having been occupied by China illegally. Now, what frustrates me deeply <laughs> is that the, the independence movement, the independence people who I believe should be holding that third view still talk about the Republic of China. And I'll just try to quickly give you a couple examples. Recently, the president of Taiwan, uh, Lai Qingde, uh, um, just around the time of National Day in, in October, he gave a big speech uh, saying uh, that, um, uh, you know, uh, Taiwan is not part of the People's Republic of China. In fact, we're the Republic of China, and the Republic of China is older than the People's Republic of China. Therefore, we are the true motherland of China. And I'm like, that's... That's the nationalist view. That's, that's the second view. You're the independence party. You're not supposed to mention the Republic of China. Now, friends of mine explained reasons why, they, why he had to do this, but I thought he didn't have to do it. He should have just gave, given a speech about all the accomplishments Taiwan has made in the la last few decades and, and such and such. Um, but I just thought, why is he mentioning that? The, another example was... Um, I wrote an, uh, an op-ed for the Taipei Times. So copy editors could sometimes write op-eds, and, uh, and I had a few published. But I wrote one uh, at the time that the um, National Palace Museum was going to loan um, a few thousand artifacts to, I believe it was the Czech Republic. They were going to do, um, uh, uh, they were going to have a display there. And the uh, the de facto ambassador, they don't call it ambassador, but the de facto ambassador of the Czech Republic said, I'm, I'm sorry, I hope I'm getting the country right. <laughs> uh, but uh, he said, um, said, oh, yes, we love uh, uh, we love Chinese history and we and it would be really important for us to display some of Chinese history in the Czech Republic because these artifacts are beautiful and, and such. Now, the reason these artifacts are here is because Chiang Kai-shek's people brought them uh, to Taiwan. Um, but a lot of people in China point to the National Palace Museum and say, well, look, you're holding on to about 700,000 pieces of our history and you're proudly displaying them. So isn't that uh, proof that you are part of China, whether it's Republic or People's Republic? Either way, the people in China, just they just like the word China in the name of the country. Um, so... So I'm working at the Taipei Times. I'm editing this piece about this potential loan to the Czech Republic. And I'm thinking, this is a terrible idea because, you know, people in, in Europe are going to come to this museum and see Republic of China, Taiwan, uh, displaying all this history from China. And they're going to get the impression like, huh, well, maybe there is a connection between Taiwan and China. Maybe they are the same country. Because that was the argument I heard from my Chinese friends when they cited these uh, these uh, museum pieces. So I wrote an op-ed just saying this was a bad idea. Um, that uh, you know these pieces are in Taiwan for very complex reasons. Um, it's uh, it's important that they're displayed. But uh, for me as a foreigner, when I went to see this museum, it was important for me to have a local friend with me explaining why they're here, what the history is. Um, so my friends were very pro-independence, but they still said, you know, this is a part of Taiwan's history, why they're here. And yes, there's a debate about whether they should be here or not. And um, so it helped me understand more about Taiwan viewing those pieces in Taiwan and having a local person explain it to me. But in the Czech Republic or in Europe, they're not going to get that chance. But my editorial 
was met with uh, somewhat hostility. I was told, Michael, you do not understand the history of the Republic of China in Taiwan, and you're demonstrating your ignorance. And I'm like, well, sort of the point. <laughs> the point is, is that, yes, I was sort of ignorant at one point. Maybe I still am. But think about the ignorance this is going to spread if we display these pieces elsewhere. Um, there were a couple other pieces that I wrote uh, on a similar in a similar vein where uh, I said, uh, you know, personally, I don't fly uh, China Airlines because it's got the name China in it. <laughs> so um, uh, and I thought, you know, Taiwanese should be boycotting this airline because it's got China in the name. So if you're supportive of independence, you should boycott it. So I submitted a piece saying that Taiwanese should make more efforts to boycott businesses that display China's names. And, uh, and again, it's like, why, why, Michael, why would, why would Taiwanese boycott the, their own businesses? And I'm like, because, and it, they just didn't seem to get it. By the way, the editor of the, um, the op-ed pages was a British guy. And, uh, so, sorry, I know I've rambled on quite a bit here, but, um, uh, This is just how confusing the situation is, where even the the pro-independence people don't understand a clear independence argument. Yeah, but <laughs> I, I, fi I find this very, very interesting and actually important, because actually if like Taiwanese colleagues listen to this and mainland Chinese colleagues, they will probably both of them shake their heads as in this, un under this not understanding, this ignorance from mm -hmm. our part about why... about how these two work together and um, you know i wouldn't i think this is part of the complexity that we actually should also try to make other people in the us and in europe understand of how intricate like the mainland and taiwan are connected and one of these things goes in my view back to the fact that they're in chinese language there are two words for chinese that in English, unfortunately, both become Chinese. What, one right, yeah. is the word for China, the country, Zhongguo. Uh, yeah. uh, and the other one Zhong, is Chinese yeah. as the ethnicity or as the, as the, as the root, like Zhonghua, or the cultural, the cultural realm, like, right? like yeah. the, the Japanese Chuka or the, the well, Zhonghua. And the, all of the, Japan, the, Ch the Taiwanese I met, I've never, ever met anyone who said we are not part of the Chunghua world. The, what they dispute is that they are part of the of the political entity that governs yeah. uh, the mainland. Yeah. But the the the, uh, the the knowledge about being part of the Chunghua of the Chinese world that one is even among the different groups, even among the pro independence people, nobody would dispute that they're part of that. Um, Well, yeah, I've I've heard I've heard people say both. I've heard people say, um, yes, we are uh, ethnic Chinese. We're part of that uh, community, um, and uh, I I haven't met anyone personally, but I've heard of people who say that yes, we should be unified with with China under a different government or have some kind of agreement with China. Um, I've heard other people say yes, we share an ethnicity. But we're separate countries, the same way um, Canada and Britain have have uh, uh, similar ethnicities and uh, his, uh, historical connections, but now they're separate. And I've heard other people just say, "No, we've got a Taiwanese identity. Yeah, we speak Chinese, but um, but you know, people in Singapore speak English, and you know that, that doesn't make a difference. Uh, we're completely separate culturally and um, uh, and in terms of countries." So. Um, I, I've heard all variations of that type of thing, but I think what you said is important because um, I've never had anyone say it to me, like I just heard you say it, <laughs> but I haven't heard anyone in China or Taiwan say it to me directly, but the more conversations I've had, the more I've realized there is a different concept, or at least I think, you know, what I've, uh, what I gather is, is that there is a different concept of what China means. Uh, in Taiwan and in mainland China. So the Taiwanese think of China as a country and they say, we are not part of that country anymore. They think that they say China is the People's Republic of China. We might be the Republic of China. That's on a technicality. We don't emphasize it. Uh, we're, we're, we're Taiwan. And, um, but 
whenever I hear the rhetoric from China where they say we are going to re reunify Taiwan with China, um, I could be wrong on this, but I'm getting a greater and greater sense that their concept of China is not really country with national borders, but more as an entity that shares history and culture. Um, and that's why uh, I've come to this conclusion, which I uh, outlined in that article uh, uh, you mentioned at the start, um, that I think there could be a deal between Taiwan and China in which Taiwan remains an independent country. Now, um, I haven't personally met anyone who agrees with me um, on this. Um, the, but I also think we've all been brainwashed by propaganda on both sides of this. And, um, and, you know, the standard message is that, um, uh, uh, China would never accept Taiwan as an ind independent country. It just wants to take it over. If Taiwan made some kind of agreement with China, um, uh, to be allies of some sort, China would still just take over Taiwan. It would take advantage of the opportunity to take it over. But um, uh, I started, uh, like, you know, when I started listening to Jeffrey Sachs and John Mearsheimer, sort of just around the time of, um, of the Ukraine invasion, I'd heard their names before, but of course they became more of a, of a internet celebrities <laughs> um, uh, after the Ukraine invasion and started listening to them quite a lot. Um, and, you know, realize that there is this school of, uh, of, of realism. And I thought, this is kind of funny, school of realism, like, aren't all schools supposed to be realism? Isn't that what we study in school is to find out what's real and differentiate what's real from propaganda. But, but then you think about it deeper and it's like, well, no, a lot of the stuff being published by academics and scholars, uh, are, you know, government funded, they have elements of propaganda and ideology in them. And, um, and I'm sure that if I'd never come to Asia, if I was a scholar in, in, uh, in, in Canada, I would retain a lot of my own cultural programming about Canada being one of the best countries in the world and, uh, and, 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 you know, better than the United States and, and, uh, and such, you know, we're all programmed that way. And I've let go of a lot of that. And I've realized, yeah, um, when I was working at the Taipei Times, what I was doing, um, I wasn't conscious of it, but I was attempting to view the Taiwan-China situation uh, from the point of view of realism. I was trying to let go of the ideology and say, okay, I'm, um, I've sort of agreed with the ideology in the past, like I'm very pro-independence and I, I still am. But I thought there, there, there must be a way for Taiwan and China to live together, to be two countries, without hostilities there must there must be a way and so i would uh read all of these editorials that they would print and they were from um i'm just gonna sorry i'm just gonna tab over to another screen i just <laughs> wrote down a few names um so in the taipei times they uh some of the editorialists are a guy named miles Yu, who is a he was a senior advisor to uh mike pompeo under the trump administration uh, Eldridge Colby was a former U.S. Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense uh, for Strategy. Uh, Richard D. Fisher, who's a senior fellow at the International Assessment and Strategy Center, which Wikipedia has said is the center, uh, said that the center undertakes classified work on behalf of U.S. government agencies. Uh, Ryan Haas, who's the director of the China Center for the Brookings Institution, which is funded by the Gates Foundation and J.P. Morgan Chase. And the New York Times even said that Brookings receives payments from foreign governments while encouraging American government officials to support policies aligned with uh, government agendas. So these are the types of people who are, uh, you know, who are littering the, the op-ed pages of, of the Taipei Times, very pro-American, former American officials. And they're all saying, yes, the only way for, for Taiwan to beat China is to buy more American weapons and to, to restock against American weapons and to fight against uh, uh, chi uh, Chinese aggression. And yeah, China has been, uh, I've seen China be aggressive towards the Philippines and the South China Sea, but but overall, I had to think about it. I thought, well, you know, how many countries has China invaded in its history? And uh, yeah, there was a brief excursion in, into Vietnam for a few months. Okay. Um, but uh, uh, 
uh, how many military bases do they have around the world? So I went and I looked that up and I was like, oh, they only have one in Africa. <laughs> and they're surrounded by U.S. bases in, in South Korea, uh, Japan, Philippines. And, and I'm just thinking about it now from China's perspective. And I'm thinking, yeah, the last thing they want is Taiwan to be a country under American influence with American bases on it. So China is fighting to make sure that doesn't happen. And um, and again, I, I'm not being pro or anti-China here. It's just um, uh, I could make a lot of arguments against uh, China, but you look at it from their perspective and you think, um, yeah, this is what they don't want. Maybe there could be some agreement where Taiwan says we will uh, uh, let go of Uh, American influence, we'll stop buying weapons from them, we'll actually give China a military base in Taiwan. So uh, I know that's not a great idea uh, by many people's standards, but hey, if it brings peace, just let them have a base. Taiwan can be a little bit more neutral, say China can do what it wants. We're not, we'll criticize it when, when we need to, but uh, we won't stop them. We'll still have good relations with the West. Um, but uh, there could be some some kind of agreement that allows China to have some hegem hegemony over Taiwan. And China probably wouldn't invade Taiwan because they would say, well, we're getting what we want. We're getting a military cultural alliance. And just the, the last point, just wrapping back to this idea of what China is, um, China could see this as a unification of sorts. If, if Taiwan were to say, and this is an idea that was propo proposed by uh, George Yeo, who is a... Um, former um uh, uh former minister of international uh, what was his title again uh former internet uh, he was the um minister of international affairs in in singapore he knows the chinese government very well and he said they would agree to taiwan and china being unified as the commonwealth of china uh or the chinese commonwealth the same way there's a british commonwealth that agrees to operate under certain values, but without any central authority. And I thought, okay, that's something that could, that would address the real problem, which is the American hegemony, rather than say, Taiwan has to be independent yeah. uh, <clears throat> under US uh, protection. So. You know, <clears throat> I think one of the things that is very important to, to remind ourselves and also others who listen to this is that um, currently, There are no bombs falling on Taipei. Currently, there are no shots being fired. Currently, we have a government in Beijing that claims Taiwan. We have a government in Taiwan that says, like, we do our own thing the way we please. And this is currently the, the, the functioning working status quo. And the mainland of China is the largest trading partner of Taiwan. <laughs> and right. people go back and yeah, forth yeah. all the time. So in a sense, yeah. we have right now a working arrangement in the absence yes. of an overall A treaty framework that would clarify the situation. In a sense, yeah. the problem is, if you want to have a clear-cut definition, that's when the problem starts. The fact that we have a fuzzy understanding that is anything but right. clear is actually what keeps the peace. And that's that's right. quite of a... That's an achievement. That's a great achievement yes. <laughs> for two yeah. parties which officially are still at war. Because if you compare the status of... Taiwan and mainland China with this with with the way that North and South Korea interact they are also not fighting but they are in a much sadder way of in of of right. of existence than okay. uh, Taipei and Beijing so in a sense right. i mean i always congratulate the two of them for being able to have these huge differences but not kill each other which is well which is a huge achievement and the question to me is how to roll that over into the yeah. next generations and hope that over time, uh, you know, convergence emerges as opposed to divergence, which is why I do wonder whether William, whether Lai, uh, President Lai's comments about Taiwan being the Republic of China, if that's not a sort of like an olive branch to Beijing saying like, look, we're yeah. not actually trying to be the Republic of Taiwan. We are still proud of being inside the same undefined commonwealth of what it means to be Chinese and yeah. without saying so. Yeah, I mean, that's what I wonder too, because uh, <clears throat> when I talked about uh, that speech to some of my Taiwanese friends, uh, they said, oh yeah, what, what Lai said was um, uh, it, um, it really pissed off Beijing, you know, that, that really made them mad. And I thought, but why? Because that's... Uh, 
that's the argument that has kept the peace. The, the idea that like, okay, uh, you can call yourselves the Republic of China, it will be the People's Republic, and uh, we'll, we'll get along, you know. And that's what happened under the nationalist government uh, before the independence government uh, came in. Um, so I thought that's sort of a regression back to the peaceful framework. So I don't know why that would upset China. Um, but again, um, I'm just looking at it from each side's perspective, uh, without, you know, with, without taking a side, I would just say, if I, if I were an advisor to the independence forces, I would say, don't mention Republic of China. Just, just don't mention it. Just talk. And you don't have to declare independence. You just have to talk about, um, all the great things that Taiwan has achieved and why Taiwanese need to be proud and it's Aboriginal history and, and such and such. And just don't even mention the word China. Um, but if, if I were uh, an advisor to the nationalist side, I would say, yeah, that's a really good point to make, uh, that the Republic of China is older than the People's Republic. Um, yeah, that that's excellent. Uh, it's an excellent point to make. But, uh, but I feel like uh, the two sides are making... the wrong arguments. A lot of my friends tell me, now keep in mind, uh, I, I can't read Chinese fluently. I speak a little bit of Chinese, but I can't read the Chinese press. So um, I'm left kind of ignorant about what's really going on in Taiwan because the English language press uh, does not, it only reports the tip of the iceberg. But a lot of my friends tell me that the Nationalist Party, the KMT, they're now pro-communist. So Historically, they were anti-communist, and they um, uh, they were saying, we're the legitimate government, you are not. But somehow, over the generations, they've become, uh, a lot of my friends believe, and I don't know what the truth is, but there's a strong belief in Taiwan that the KMT uh, would rejoin China under uh, communist rule. Uh, so, so it seems like a lot of... sides are changing <laughs> yeah no but but yeah. that makes absolute sense you're and you're right the kmt is the most pro pro unification party at the moment uh -huh. but it makes total sense because the kmt is a chinese nationalist party it's not a taiwanese right. nationalist party they are the ones who okay. fought the civil war with mao zedong it was i mean yeah uh, chiang kai-shek was a nationalist he retreated yeah. chiang kai-shek never thought of himself as not chinese never yeah He said, yeah. I have the whole thing. And, you know, maybe this is where we can bring in a couple of these historical examples that are also very illuminating, um, uh, which which carry all the way forward until now. You know, uh, the Republic of China still has. So that's that's Taiwan, right? The Republic yeah. of China still has a Mongolian affairs bureau. Because okay. they actually <laughs> never never rescinded the claims over Mongolia. They don't enforce it anymore, but they still really? have that yeah. bureau. And okay. <clears throat> Taiwan, the Taipei, the KMT is responsible for Mongolia only being able to join the United Nations in 1961 or 1962, early 60s. They mm -hmm. were the ones who were sitting in the Security Council, right, in the early, in the 50s and early 60s, uh, 60s um, mm -hmm. and vetoed. the accession of Mongolia into the UN yeah. because the KMT said, no, 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 Mongolia is actually part of the Republic of China. They are part of us, even though at that yeah. time they were only uh, yeah. actively reigning over Taiwan, right? So yeah. these territorial claims, they last for a very long time and they're very hotly debated usually, right, inside yeah. countries. But in, in in this sense, you know, the... the what the different parts feel that they themselves are and have a claim to that is extremely like intricate uh, uh, across across these right. different sections yeah yeah i wasn't aware of the mongolia issue but i know that uh, taiwan has claim to some islands in the philippines <laughs> so um so uh taiwan china and the philippines are all battling over this uh, small group of islands and and it's this one island that um Taiwan's got a, an air force base on, they've just occupied it. And the Philippines took it to an international tribunal and the tribunal said, um, uh, I think they said it's technically a rock, it's not an island. So it doesn't belong to anybody. And so it has to be shared. And uh, Taiwan uh, says, well, we don't recognize that ruling. So we're not going to abide by it. We're just going to keep our yeah. base here and we're not going to share it. And so I thought, okay, gee, that's interesting. You know, yeah, <laughs> Taiwan they, they not... all play the same game, actually. Yeah, it's yeah. it's then just in public perception where actually, especially Western propaganda yeah. tries to make us believe it's a clear-cut case of evil authoritarian mm -hmm. expansionist China versus 
poor and 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 suppressed Taiwan, and this yeah. is a clear-cut case, which it is not. That's the whole point. It's a very intricate case. But the mm -hmm. question to me is um, how to maybe not how to resolve the conflict because conflict in and of itself is nothing necessarily bad. What's bad is when it escalates into war. So how to keep the conflict boiling beneath the war, but within still the realm of everybody being able to do business. And maybe let me just give you one example. Like I have a good yeah. Taiwanese friend who works for um, Air China. So the Taiwanese. Mm -hmm. That's oh, it. no, no. China Airlines. Sorry. China Airlines. Works for China yeah. Airlines. The China Airlines has a cargo division. And the cargo division had one or two airplanes, which they painted. And the sea of cargo took the shape of uh, Taiwan. They, they painted oh, okay. the shape yeah. of Taiwan. And what did the Chinese side do? They just closed their airports for those particular planes. Yeah. Which then yeah. Led, uh, led, led to this, 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 this pragmatism of the Taiwanese saying like, okay, we're not going to paint more airplanes like this because we still want yeah. the business with the mainland, right? right. And thereby you kind of keep some form of balance, although like both sides keep trying to push the boundaries of what's possible. But within yeah. the framework of still peaceful coexistence. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, um, it sort of goes back to my point, too, about uh, about boycotting that, that airline or bo boycotting these types of businesses. It's, you know, um, uh, you know, with Taiwan painting the seas, uh, uh, you know, as Taiwan yeah, is a little bit provocative. But, you know, at the end of the day, the public supports this airline. The, the public buys tickets to this airline. They 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 fly it. Uh, they support it. So um, and so they, you know, they support the name China being there. And when I try to make the argument in print uh, that maybe this is something that Taiwanese can think about um, just to assert the Taiwanese identity. So we know that the government can't change the name of the airline because if they did that, um, you know, that would hurt the economy. China would cut off, you know, that airline uh, landing in, in China. So so they keep the name. So the government can't change the name, but the people could take matters into their own hand and say, yeah, we won't fly it. We're going to do our business elsewhere. If the airline goes under because of massive boycotts, they sell it to <laughs> EVA Air, Airways or or some other entity, and then the name disappears. The government doesn't have to do anything. But, but, the, uh, but the people support this. And then the newspaper, the pro-independence newspaper I worked for, uh, was aghast at, at the idea. <laughs> so um, I was like, okay, you know, I throw up my hands and go, whatever. I, uh, it makes me feel a little bit more um, uh, ambivalent about the whole debate. You know, I'm, uh, I'm supportive of Taiwanese sovereignty uh, solely on the basis that that's what the people here want. And I think it becomes a human right issue. Uh, no matter where in the world this type of thing happens, if the people of Texas want to form their own country, you know, they should have the right to do that. Um, so it's that's that's the only framework I see it through. But uh, if Taiwan keeps getting bogged down in all of these, um, uh, like like for instance, China's claim to Taiwan is very clear cut. I listen to it; it can be uh, told in a very quick summary. Uh, I understand it. Even if I don't agree with it, uh, I understand it. But when I listen to the Taiwanese arguments, it's like a mystery wrapped in a riddle. And and that makes me go, yeah, okay, whatever. If China takes it over, uh, whatever, I have no opinion. You know, <laughs> it's it makes me exhausted uh, trying to uh, be pro-independence when uh, it, just, uh, it, it just seems like such a convoluted issue that nobody wants to unwrap here, you know. Um, yeah, but you know, maybe, isn't yeah, this right. maybe where just the whole situation is works in different categories from the ones that we are used to in the West and maybe also to our yeah. Chinese and Taiwanese right. friends, you know, um, we even people like us who for years live in Asia, live in, in, in Taiwan, in China, in Japan, and we try, we honestly try to wrap our heads around it. We honestly try to understand, but it's still yeah. this difficult for us to yeah. grasp within our mental framework and within the English language, the actual mm -hmm. complexity of how th how these, these, this conflict has been working out over the past 80 years. I keep thinking it's still an unresolved Second World War conflict, um, yeah. but it's the it's it's actually I, I don't i wouldn't blame i wouldn't blame anyone in taiwan for the difficulty that it is to kind of make make um to to express what 
the Taiwanese or the different sentiments of the different groups within Taiwan is towards the significant other, which is China, because it doesn't play out the same way that we would expect, you know, independence movements or revolutionary movements to work, because that is a Western framework of yes, yeah. relations yeah. work. Yeah. yeah. And you mentioned that it, 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 um, it's a remnant of the Second World War, and it goes back uh, before that. Yeah. And uh, when I look at the Chinese side of this, too, uh, when I go really far back in history, so you look at 1911, which is when the Qing Dynasty fell. And that was when the Nationalist Party, the KMT, they they rose, um, and uh, and took power. Um, but around uh, nineteen uh, about nineteen twenty one um, is when the Communist Party formed, and so there was so you know China is a huge country. You can imagine back in nineteen eleven, it was probably a, it was very difficult to unify it. There were lots of different warlords uh, governing different regions. Um, and then there were different political movements and uh, ideologies. So you had the Nationalist Party um, controlling most of China, but then you had the communists uh, who uh, developed a few years later. Um, <clears throat> but there were a lot of communists within the National Nationalist Party. They they worked together, um, and there seemed to be some kind of uh, agreement. You know, they say, okay, you can have that part of China. We'll take this part, and they, there was a lot of cooperation, and there were. The, there were areas where the two parties were together sort of working as one. So, so they were quite unified. Um, so Sun Yat-sen was technically the president of China at that time. Uh, he, his health was failing. He passed power to Chiang Kai-shek and Chiang Kai-shek um, took a more hostile attitude towards the communists. And he said, you know what, we can run China by ourselves. And he tried to purge all the communists out of the, out of the Nationalist Party, and uh, and by doing so, he ignited the Chinese Civil War. So, um, so in my imagination, like with without knowing any of the history, and I think this is probably true for most Westerners. You know, uh, when we think about Chinese history, we think, oh yeah, China was a free country until uh, the communists came in and invaded. Right. That that that's just that's just sort of a um, that's just an impression. It's not even a narrative that comes from somewhere. It's just because of our cultural programming to who, who always viewing the communists as the evil invaders and uh, and whatnot, you know, going back to the Cold War. So I kind of had a general idea. That's probably what happened. But when I looked up the history, I thought, oh, they were working together. And it was the it was Chiang Kai-shek who started the, the Civil War. So, um, of course, this was several generations ago. But um nations they still can they still hold institutional memory and i'm pretty sure that within the communist party they still have an institutional memory of when they worked together with the republic of china they worked to, uh, together with uh with uh this other party and that it was this other party that started the war so um i, I could see I'm, I'm not sure if the communists I have no idea if the communists still think this way, but it's possible that they still view China as a large entity that can be governed in a power sharing agreement that they don't need to have central authority. That uh, So going back to this idea, if Taiwan becomes a, a, a Chinese ally, as milit offers military cooperation, offers cult you know, cultural cooperation, um, maybe even educational cooperation where they teach both sides of their histories in schools. Um, and uh, China wouldn't need to invade Taiwan if it was if it was an ally that was already providing most of what it wanted. So the the military access and the um, uh, and the sort of the cultural and historical unification, the idea that they are um, a Commonwealth of China. Um, and I think that goes back to, uh, back in the 1920s when uh, the KMT and the CCP were uh, cooperating. And so China probably has some kind of uh, memory of that, whereas Taiwan has totally forgotten that. I tell my Taiwanese friends about that. And they're like, really? Are you sure? No, that's got to be wrong. And I'm like, well, you can look it up. <laughs> well, I mean, the, the, the good news is that uh, despite the warfare between the two, and the warfare was bad, um, 
there is a there's a very long history of actually getting some making it somehow work g- going all the way to the fact that even right now there are these tiny little islands kidman and matsu right in front of the coast of shaman right. and the uh, kidman yeah. receives its sweet water right now from shaman there yeah. and the, this is it's these islands the the uh, prc respect the fact that they are under uh under republic of china control and the there was very bad shelling right in the in the yeah. early 50s these were like right. yeah. very badly and then that started that that ceased and it didn't didn't restart again and also the the there is an a cross trade affairs bureau on both sides there are ways to interact and we've had even during the second world war there was a moment when chiang kai shek met mao zedong because they both agreed to fight together against the japanese which they did yeah which they did yeah. and we had a meeting of xi jinping and ma Yinjong uh, back right. in 2004 <laughs> I want to say it was 16, in Singapore. I remember 15, that. 16 yeah. in Singapore. Um, yeah. And you know, this is a big step for Xi Jinping to stand next and shake the hand of the leader of the KMT leader at the time okay. of, of Taiwan, because it means yeah. you recognize, right? Even on a picture, you recognize as somebody that you can meet, yeah. uh, which is a big, big step. And yeah. both of them have shown willingness to, to do things and say things in the spirit of not not going to war the problem that i see is that the united states is trying whatever it can in order to sub- subvert that that slow process of reconciliation and make sure that uh, taiwan remains a possible beacon to fight a war and you know the, the yeah. preparation of like making taiwan into another ukraine uh, to me yeah. that preparation is oh. coming from the us not from china exactly well this is what um i concluded when i was editing all of this all of these editorials and all of this uh copy <laughs> that was going into the taipei times i just saw the recurring themes just and and the repeating themes and the and the language that was um uh that was repeating over and over again like this the standard phrases like freedom and democracy or and such and such um it just got thrown in for no reason <laughs> you know um and um uh but when I looked at, you know, all of these tensions that were happening between Taiwan and China, like it always seemed to be provoked by something that the U.S. did. <laughs> you know, it was, um, you know, most notably it was Nancy Pelosi's visit to um, Taiwan. That's what really crystallized something for me, because I thought uh, there was no reason for her to visit here. You know, she just stopped over for 19 hours. She wasn't here for a full day. There were no trade agreements to be signed. There was nothing important to be discussed. And, you know, um, Previously, I would have thought, okay, if, if an American official needs to visit Taiwan to discuss some important matter, to work out a deal of some sort, I, I, I get that. Um, but um, she came for, for no reason except to provoke China. Because the when I discussed this with friends, uh, or when I uh, saw the issue come up in the Taipei Times, if anyone questioned... Uh, why is she coming here? This is only to provoke China. The response was, well, uh, Taiwan is a free country and uh, and leaders can come here anytime they want. So it was more to prove a point that she could. Um, but of course, China responded by conducting a lot of invasion drills around the island. Um, uh, but uh, even aside from that, it was just like ev- every day, every couple of days, there was some article about some arms deal or how... Uh, Taiwan needs to sign an arms deal or how someone in the U.S. Congress is supportive of Taiwan on this arms deal. It's just like, oh, come on, (laughs) you know, give it a break. There's other news happening, too, you know. Um, Mike Pompeo, actually, he, uh, um, sorry, I have to remember. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it was Mike Pompeo who came to Taiwan to give some talks. And he was was actually being paid by the Taipei Times (laughs) to come to Taiwan to uh, give this speaking tour. So I thought, oh, it's great. They get to pay him to come here to spout all of uh, their their rhetoric and propaganda, and then they get to report it. <laughs> and uh, it was it was a huge conflict of interest. It's like, but this is how propaganda works. And um, uh, sorry, I've, I've kind of forgotten the point I was I was getting at here. But oh, yeah, but basically, it's the United States involvement that's always provoking any tensions between Taiwan and China. I mean, yeah. You take them out of the yeah. picture, they seem to get along. 
you it's know? it's one it's it, it's there are so many instances of this unprovoked provocations as in you know the, yeah. the, the these are then the reasons when the chinese react to them when the mainland mm -hmm. or the prc reacts to them then yeah. the western media goes like look at how what how horrible i mean they were not provoked nobody provoked them to do this it's like yeah. no it was clearly provoked you you provoked this they 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 answer to something and then you use that as a pretext in order to sell to your own uh, community that you need to stand up and be firm against china yeah. and this is like how they yeah. how the us like throws itself a ball to then use yeah. again right <laughs> it's like basically exactly. a boomerang yeah. that comes back and you use it again and again um right. it's so this form of stupid like propaganda yeah. is like what I wonder how we can dismantle it a little bit while um, it's it's really hard. It's really tough because yeah. it's so simple yeah. to do. Well, here's another thing that really amazed me was um, uh, while I was editing all this stuff, I, I came across this repeated phrase, the ADIZ, which is the Air Defense Identification Zone. So Taiwan's Air Taiwan's ADIZ. So um, uh, almost every day, there is some story about how China sends 11, um, 11 warplanes over Taiwan's ADIZ, uh, a record number of, of Chinese airplanes over the ADIZ, like over and over again. And the implication, it's trying to give you the implication that the ADIZ is, uh, international, is an international boundary, like they crossed international airspace. <clears throat> So they're not using the term international airspace, but just the term itself without kind of any explanation, it just plants an idea in the head that, okay, they crossed an international boundary um, or even an unofficial international boundary. <clears throat> but after seeing this phrase a lot, I thought, what is the ADIZ anyway? <laughs> you know? So I look it up and it's basically a boundary that was created by the U.S. Um, after, uh, after the Second World War. And the boundary extends way into mainland China. Way into so, Fujian province, really far right, into the mainland. Really far in. Like, I kind of had this mental image. Like, if you don't think about it, this is, this is how this messaging or propaganda works, is that it's, it creates an impression without saying anything directly. So it creates the impression yeah. to everybody that it's, an, it's, it's this set boundary close to Taiwan. Then you look at the boundary and it's way in mainland China. So <clears throat> Chinese airplanes can fly over mainland China without coming anywhere near Taiwan. And they get to report, oh, 32 airplanes, and, 32 and, warplanes yeah, crossed. And, you know. and, and you know, even the Taiwanese don't take this thing uh, serious, uh, at least not the part that goes into mainland yeah. China, because otherwise you would have yeah. to report way too much. And just for everybody yeah. to li who listens, like an ADIZ is something that any government in the world can declare and say, like, all with this airspace, I demand that you send me an information that you're about to fly over it or that you want to cross it. Um, yeah. with the implication that 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 impacts your security, right? Uh, and the, the ADIZ of, the, of of Taiwan is just ridiculously ridiculously large. And even the when the the Thai, uh, Chinese PRC fighter airplanes actually enter close to Taiwanese or into Taiwanese airspace, they usually do so at very narrow corners because actually that airspace is really heavily frequented by um, yeah. by uh, commercial carriers. So it's as you're saying. As you're saying, this is a pure propaganda tool in order to invoke the impression that China continuously and all the time uh, illegally crosses into Taiwanese airspace, which sometimes happens, but not as much as they try to do to make you believe. Yeah. Yeah. So overall, in my experience, um, <clears throat> I I really strongly believe that the, the China's threat against Taiwan has been uh, both manufactured and widely exaggerated. And I say that without, um, uh, how should I put this? But uh, this is not coming from a point of view of Chinese propaganda. I have not been reading their propaganda or listening to it. Solely by reading Taiwan's own propaganda, <laughs> I realize, uh, no, this is exaggerated. This isn't true. You know, it makes me go go back and do my own research into this and listen to other people. And I realize, you know, okay, look, um, <clears throat> I lived in China for three months um, uh, before I lived in Taiwan. Three months was all I could take. I had to get out of there. Um, I loved a lot of things about China. I will say I love the people, the culture. Um, it was uh, an endlessly interesting place. 
but it's sort of like that old maxim. It's it's called a Chinese saying. I don't even know if it's Chinese. It might might just be uh, um, uh, might just be uh, a rumor. But uh, you know, may you live in interesting times, right? So China is a vastly interesting country, but at the same time, <laughs> I just I did not feel completely safe there. In Taiwan, this is probably the most, uh, apologies to any Taiwanese listening, this is probably the most boring place I have ever been, but it's also this one of the safest places I've been in, and uh, it's why I've stayed here for, for so long. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, but with China, yeah, if, if you want to drag a lot of anti-China stories out of me, yeah, I could talk uh, quite a long time um, about some of my experiences there, what I really think about uh, China. Yeah, I could say lots of bad things about them, but I'm not talking about that now, right? So we're talking about Taiwan. And so um, so it kind of frustrates me when people say that I'm spouting Chinese propaganda, because I'm like, well, if I was in China, <laughs> you know, um, uh, I would be saying something different and maybe not allowed to say something different, but still trying, you know, it's uh... <laughs> Michael, let's hope that at the end of this talk and at the end of like everybody listening here, um, people in the mainland of China and people in Taiwan are going to be equally angry at us because that's okay, usually yeah, a yeah. good sign of like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, at least making everybody angry and not just one side, yeah. um, which yeah. doesn't make the situation better. But still, um, everybody listening, this is as far as we can try. Um, we are honestly trying to understand. It is extremely complex. But um, Michael Riches, if people want to read more of you, where should they go? Should they go to your Substack? What's your... Oh, yeah, I do have a Substack. Um, I started writing during the pandemic uh, on pandemic issues. Um, and uh, before... Before that, I, I was never really that uh, politically or uh, culturally. Uh, I, I never really felt the need to sort of comment too much on political or social issues. But during COVID, I, I found that uh, a lot of my own liberal values were uh, not being followed by a lot of my liberal friends. And I tried to sort of be persuasive on some uh, some issues where I thought that I would reinforce some good liberal thought let's, on the pandemic let's not that... stick into let's not sting into this hornet's nest you know no, i mean we'll leave I'm, that I'm for only, the next time <laughs> i'm only meant i'm only mentioning that because um that's you'll see a lot of that on my sub stack but then after that i went okay i'm done with this um and now i write a lot about uh, taiwan issues and uh and okay. some current political issues so it's subtopical.substack.com um And uh, it's like subtropical, but without the R. So okay. I'm trying to do a okay. play on words there. Wonderful. Yeah. By the uh, way, but before, sorry, before we go, can I just mention one more thing? Um, and uh, um, so President Lai, uh, William Lai, uh, or his Chinese name, Lai Qingde, uh, he's in Hawaii right now, which I think is quite interesting. So uh, uh, on an unofficial visit, but of course being greeted by a lot of... Uh, Uh, diplomats and dignitaries. Well, he he may have flown out by now, but yesterday he was in Hawaii. And I thought uh, that was interesting. That would have been a good opportunity for him to sort of make uh, Taiwan's case by citing a bit of uh, Hawaiian history. You know, he could have landed in Hawaii and he said, we recognize the provisional government of the Kingdom of Hawaii as the legitimate rulers of this territory. As the victims of aggression ourselves, We do not support the illegal takeovers of independent countries by force, as what happened in Hawaii in 1893. Uh, but of course, he will never say well, anything like that. <laughs> I mean, by the time this talk goes online, I'm going to have the other one online with uh, with Keanu, uh, Keanu Sai, who's actually one oh. of the people pushing for oh, the okay. <laughs> Hawaiian, I mean, the, the, the recognition yeah. that the Kingdom of Hawaii has never ceased to exist. And... Um, But again, like if William, if William Lai really wanted to burn bridges with the U.S., that would be the way to go. So <laughs> yeah, 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 he yeah, 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 he'll never do that. Yeah. Well, okay. All right. Uh, okay. Everybody, it's going to stay interesting. Let's, hey, let's hope it stays peaceful as well. Uh, Michael Riches, thank you very much for your time today. Uh, thank you very much, Pascal. I appreciate it.